Hello and welcome to Unprofessional Engineering. My name is James. And you have Sir Luke. <laughs> oh, I like what you did there, you Sir see what I'm, Luke. Do you see what I'm leading with there? Yes, huh? the Sir huh? Luke of the Pittsburgh Vale. Um, we're continuing on with something we were supposed to do, I would guess roughly... <laughs> 150 ago. episodes ago, apparently. Was this is a uh, write-in. This is a write-in. So back when we were doing the James is on a Game of Thrones kick before the disappointing end oh, season, yeah. we did something about weapons, torture devices, yeah, medieval and torture castles. devices. I remember yeah. that. That one was was a great episode, by the way. Go check that one out. But we promised that we would do an episode on medieval armor. So now, many years later, we've finally gotten around to that. So topic. how awesome is it that we can say years later, like, I love that we've been doing this for like, it's been what, like four years now? More, maybe Part more? of me loves this and part of me hates that it's, it's been like, this it's long. It's like a love hate. It really is. And that I haven't seen you in almost two years. I know. What's that about? It's heartbreaking. <sighs> Anyways, let's get into medieval armor, Luke. Medieval armor. I feel like I, I, this is your favorite part, so I don't want to steal your thunder. The whole history and James is a history buff nerd. Just go ahead. Do your thing. So before we get into that, I'm pulling a little switcheroo on you, Luke. Switcheroonie. I want to play a game with you to start things. Oh, no. Things. Okay, I don't like these games. And I won't look because I know, is, look. is this the parts of the armor game? This is the parts of the armor game. So I couldn't, they were, there were a lot of really words that start with G's and Y's and P's and don't remember any of them. Okay, well, I'll, I'll try and keep it at a high level because there's okay. a, lot of, a lot of bits out there. Go ahead. So we're thinking about plate armor in particular, as opposed to like chain, which we'll talk about the differences here in a little bit. Okay. First, what's the thing that you wear on your head, Luke? That's called a helmet. Very good. A helmet ding, ding, or ding, a ding, helm. Ding, ding. Now, what's the part that covers your eyes on the helmet? Shield? It's a visor, Luke. A Come on. visor? It's kind of like a visor on your head, oh, but like a visor over your okay. face. I feel I'm going to do bad. Now, some helmets are kind of fancy, and they have almost like a uh, part down the middle of them. Do you know what that's called? The part down the middle, the mohawk. The mohawk, also known as the comb. The comb, that's, yeah, same thing. Comb, okay. mohawk. What's the piece that covers your neck? Uh, your neck, thoracic. The thoracic, otherwise known as the gorget, the G-O-R-G-E-T. Yeah, see, they, these are the ones I, uh, I, can't, I can't even pronounce them. You gorget. can do this one. Okay. What's the one, the piece that covers your chest up. Oh, the, the, the breastplate. Well done, Luke. That's very good. It's an easy one. How about the parts that cover your hands? Um, gauntlets. You get this one. Gauntlets. Well done. Um, how about the parts that cover your shins? Hmm. Um, uh, I have no clue. The greaves. G-R-E-A-V-E-S. Yes. Yeah. Of course. So there's there's a bunch of other ones that I don't think we're going to bother going through, but there's specific parts that cover your shoulders, the paldrums. There's the parts that cover your your uh, biceps, the elbows, the knees, the feet. Apparently, the feet are sabatons, uh, tacits. That's kind of like your maybe groin area, like thighs and groin that hang down from the breastplate. But it's kind of important to call out all of these different bits and pieces because these were all manufactured or smithed separately. And so whoever was buying the armor would actually have to buy all of these individual parts. And it was kind of like a la carte, right? It doesn't mean that you're going to get that full suit of armor all at one time. You might only buy certain pieces of it, like maybe only a breastplate. Yeah. I mean, if you don't have podcast money, you're not buying a whole kit. How could they even afford the whole kit since they probably didn't have podcasts? I'm telling you. I'm telling you. Do you think the court jester was like the podcast host of exactly. the medieval yeah. times? Yeah, I'm sure that's what it was. I mean, you're, you're, you're essentially a jester. I mean, that's, you know, you're here just for fun. I really am. You're right. And now that I've made so much podcast money, this is all just for fun anyways. I actually reject payment at this point. The, the thing that I thought was crazy was when we started looking at like the how it's made. And I know like we're going to do history, I uh -huh. think, but like the how it's made, like these cats were literally, they were essentially tailors, but they did it with 
like pieces of metal, which is crazy because like, I'm, I'm much more muscular than you are. You are very muscular. So like you yes. mentioned biceps, like my bicep plates would be at least twice as big as yours and my chest four plates times I bet. At, at least. So like they were essentially tailors, except they'd had to do this in metal. And I imagine they had templates that they would use and they'd have to cut them out and make sure it fit and pound it and do all that sort of stuff to it. But it's just crazy that to think that they're tailoring in metal because it's essentially a suit that they're wearing. Yeah. It's just made out of metal. A metal suit. You're right. I never thought of them as tailors, but you're right. There is a lot of tailoring that is involved in this. Mm -hmm. So getting into the history a little bit, um, I guess the first thing that I'll call out is at least myself, I'm going to be focusing on two kinds of armor. One, there's going to be the chain mail and the plate mail, right? So chain mail, a whole bunch of tiny little metal rings, all tailored together to fit somebody. Um, these ones were a little less, it seemed a little less custom snug, right? Mm -hmm. Because there were versions of it that would just cover almost like your whole body. Like it would just drape down covering yeah. you. You'd wear like a pillow sack. That's exactly it. Or like a Snuggie. Is that what they're called? Snuggies? Yeah, a Snuggie. I think so. Yeah, it felt like, or it looked like one of those. And then also there's like the plate mail. So kind of like the traditional armor you think of as a knight but on a horse. don't right? forget Mithril. Mithril? Isn't yeah. that the material that's that the, it's that's, made out of? That's what uh, uh, Bilbo, not Bilbo, Frodo wore. Frodo. Oh, with yeah. his chain mail. It was yeah. made out of Mithril. It was made yeah. out of Mithril or Methril, however you say it. Go check out our episode on top fictional materials if you haven't done so. Oh, I think that, did, that one made the list. I think you. I think that was yours. That was one of yeah, yours for sounds, sure. Sounds nerdy enough to be mine. Um, okay, jumping into the history, Luke. Mail or chain mail is made of a bunch of iron rings. Uh, and these uh, could be riveted or welded shut. Um, and I think it started back as far as 500 BC in Eastern yeah, Europe is what, what I, I saw. saw. Now, I didn't realize that they could rivet or weld stuff in 500 BC. So that was kind of news to me. I think, I think the welding was they were taking harder materials like, uh, like iron, and they were actually welding it with softer materials like like brass so so the the joint wasn't so the probably same always the, broke there i'm sure it, it broke hit. all the time yeah but i'm pretty sure the the weldment material was softer stuff that had a lower melting temperature like like bronze or brass or something like that would be my guess okay so that makes sense so on top of this chain mail that they're constructing out of all of these tiny little rings over time smaller pieces of plate metal would be added to this armor for extra protect protection, especially in your more vulnerable bits, you know, like maybe your neck and maybe, well, we won't go into wherever else, but anyways, mm -hmm. uh, they'd also use hardened leather um, and splinted construction for arm and leg pieces. So at the start, it wasn't like you were just wearing all little rings all over your whole body. It would generally be your shoulders, cover your torso, and then perhaps draping down further. But the rest of you would be more in like a harder, hardened leather armor that you'd be working with. So that's kind of how things worked for a long time until early plate mail showed up. So of course there were different styles. There were different ways that the rings can be linked together. And if you go online on the Googles, you can check out the different way that the links were all connected. Some would provide smaller gaps than others. So likely they would be more expensive as well, but they would offer greater protection. Uh, but the early plate kind of started in Italy is what I saw. Um, and this was somewhere between the 13th and 15th century and being made out of iron. Before I go into that, is there anything else that you wanted to talk about previous to this plate? So, so the, the only thing that I saw that was previous and, and it wasn't it wasn't metal armor, but apparently there was, if you look at um, samurai and you go like way, way, way back, like there was, they would use, they would make um, 
uh, like breastplates and stuff like that out of bamboo. And they would actually oh. do bamboo on their forearms and their, their, their biceps. So it wasn't armor in the way that we think of it. It was probably more like the leather. It was like whatever they had at hand that would prevent their arm from getting broken. Because if you think about it, the weapons they were using weren't super effective. I mean, even, even a sword would have to chop through like a couple of times to get through bamboo. So uh, so that's the only thing I saw that was, was earlier was there was some um uh like it was mostly samurais and stuff like that, that i like uh, that you brought that. samurai into this picture i hadn't even thought of that but, but it when, does beg when, the question yeah when you are wearing bamboo armor does that mean that the panda bear becomes your biggest adversary because it, it could it's probably you tracking you down to eat you, you right no yeah okay um before we move on luke with early plate mail in italy it's already time for a word from our sponsor. Wow, time flies. Yeah, it really does. Who do we uh, got? It, I thought you were gonna like maybe throw out like the no. Panda Association <laughs> or pa something. Pa Panda Express, the worst, the worst <laughs> Chinese restaurant <laughs> ever. It's terrible. I just went there a month or two ago. Oh, it was so, so not bad. good. Ah oh, man. Anyways, sorry, Panda Express. There goes a sponsor. I still love you. It was great when I was in college. But anywho, we don't have any sponsors, but we do have many shout outs, in fact. So Ooh. let me get to them. Brian B writes in and says, just wanted to write in and say that you guys are doing an amazing job on of the course. show. Thank you. I'm currently a first year at Wilkes University in PA, double majoring in electrical engineering and computer science. Oh, <laughs> mud ducks. Right? Nice. I have lived in PA for most of my life. So it's nice to hear that you guys are from PA. Uh, if it's not so much to ask, I'd love some of those stickers you guys mentioned. And if possible, a signed one. Man, I keep forgetting that we need to sign some of these stickers because there have been multiple people that we promised Pretty them to. Pretty famous. We really are famous. So we'll be getting those in the mail in <laughs> four years, Brian. At least. Uh, Gareth M., Big fan of the show. Love the work you do. I was advised to listen to a lighthearted but informative podcast to keep my engineering knowledge by my lecturer. I've started, uh, I'm starting a degree in integrated masters at 38 years old. Oh, I'm still deciding Good on luck which. With that. Yeah, right. I'm still deciding on which branch to specialize in going forward but I know it won't be civil as they're the worst. <laughs> they are the worst. I love it. Well done. And last but not least, <laughs> Bettina R. I don't know if I'm saying that right. B-E-T-T-I-N-A. I, I don't know. I, I think I got it. Close. close enough, yeah. Right? I'm currently a fourth year mechanical engineering major. Good job. At South Dakota Mines and Technology. Ooh, go mud ducks. Yeah, which by the way, should be on your list of great engineering schools. Winky face. My dad and I found your podcast while driving back to Minnesota after my internship last fall in Kentucky and have you, been obsessed since. You pronounce it wrong. It's Minnesota. <laughs> Minnesota. Well done. You're, you're far better than I am at that. Uh, listening to your show helps keep me motivated and engaged in my engineering studies. And your friendship and banter always makes me feel better after long days of work. Isn't oh, how nice? we fooled everybody that we're actually friends, James. I did write back to someone. I don't remember if it was this email that said, Luke often describes me as like a bad girlfriend or something like that, or a bad yeah. ex-girlfriend, depending on the day. <laughs> so friends, you know, it's it maybe is something. Anywho, if any of you would like a shout out, if you have some suggestions for the show, if you want us to send you some signed stickers somewhere between today and the next 14 years, anything of that sort, go ahead and email us at unprofessionalengineering at gmail.com and don't forget to subscribe like share and we love the reviews and don't forget to tell your smart devices to play the unprofessional engineering podcast beautiful all right on to early plate mail in italy luke shoot the 15th century iron armor um it could be caraburst or case hardened uh to give the surface harder steel the plate armor became cheaper than mail by the 15th century because it required less labor way less labor and labor had become much more expensive after the black death because it turned out everybody died um <laughs> though it did require really large furnaces to produce larger blooms to make these big pieces of metal um it's interesting though that you know it offered better protection reduced mobility but it was a lot more inexpensive because all those tiny little rings that you had to close and weld shut somehow were a lot more work than this custom fitted armor that you would be getting. So I, I was a fan of the Viking show on 
USA I or watched the History a good Channel. Chunk of it, it, it got weird after like season three. Yeah. But like the first two, three seasons were really good. And once his son showed up, I was like, eh. if you had to choose between like being like the Black Knight in Monty Python, where you can barely <laughs> move. Sorry. <laughs> um, remember the guy he kept getting his limbs chopped off? Uh, Just a flesh wound. Uh, either him or you could be like a Viking and like super agile and nimble. Like, I would think that your chance of, of surviving battle would depend on your speed and agility, not just your ability to just like defend from a sword. Like if, if, if you can't even swing the sword because you can barely move, then I, I never got it. But I guess if everybody's wearing armor, it's probably okay. Cause it's like, yeah, equal. yeah. But I feel like it comes down to maybe how good you are with the sword, right? Like if you're yeah. really agile, you might not want the armor because it holds you back. But yeah. I don't know. It feels like you'd have to be really good to be going armorless against some dude in a big tin can, right? Yeah, I mean, Monty Python was a perfect example. The one guy had very little armor on. The Black Knight was head there to toe. His and... arms and legs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Think about Game of Thrones, the Red Viper armorless, basically, against yeah. the mountain took the man down yeah. until he got his head squished. Yeah. Spoiler. Sorry about that. Spoiler. People. Anywho, uh, mail continued to be used to protect joints, which could not be adequately protected by uh, the plate mail. So meaning chain mail was used to protect those joints. So that would be things like your armpits, like your elbow. You'd still have uh, mail there. Uh, other advantage of plate was that the lance could like the lance dress could be fitted to the breastplate. So if you're using a lance, it was easier to kind of hold and maneuver. Um, the skull cap began to evolve as well. So they used to wear just kind of like little metal caps on the top of their head or like leather or whatever. Uh, and these started to become true helmets with a comb and a visor, Luke, mm -hmm. for those of you who know Luke's parts. Uh, but probably the most recognized style of armor in the world became the plate armor associated with like the late middle-aged European knights. The knights. Right. And this was like the 17th century age of enlightenment kind of across all of Europe. So by about 1400, full harness of plate armor had been developed, um, heavy cavalry started to dominate the battlefield. So, you know, people mounted on horses became a thing. And this is part of what really spurred on the armor. You don't necessarily have to be walking around in the armor and moving yourself and being mm -hmm. agile because you have this big old war horse hulking you around. Well, so the war you horses, want to be protected on it. Yeah, the war horses themselves, they made they made breastplates so that they wouldn't get impaled with like a spear. They wore breastplates on the horses too, so. Yeah, exactly. So over time, I'm going to skip through this pretty quickly. 15th and 16th century, the armor basically got bigger and heavier, thicker to be able to prevent because as the armor got better, the weapons got better. It was kind of like a seesaw, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and that's when Oh, low velocity firearms showed up. Full suits of armor or like breastplates could stop bullets from like a decent distance. But if we were up close and you got blasted by one of these Not guns, even way back then, yeah, it wasn't going to do anything. And the same thing, crossbow bolts could probably stop and not really be penetrating, but it could still hit some of those like soft areas if you were really a good shot. So this was kind of where you started to see plate armor become more obsolete because of firearms. So again, technology kind of like knocking that out. That being said, things like plate, like breastplates were still used for a long time. If you look at uh, Napoleon, his army still had breastplates on because it was at least some form of protection. Now, like today, it would be totally useless, right? Like yeah. no reason to have that on. But even so far as the American Civil War, so what's that, like 1860, there were still soldiers in the Civil War that would bring iron and steel vests and they would buy them from folks along the road. But a lot of the time they ended up throwing them out because they were either too heavy to march oh, with could you or imagine? there was like a stigma that you were kind of a wimp. So- uh, you would be getting made fun of for wearing your armor, so they would get rid of it. So bullying, Luke. They were getting bullied. Even they were then. getting bullied. And fast forward to the lady in Katanning that invented Kevlar. I mean, yeah. that's essentially modern day armor. I mean, it's all the way down to a flexible fabric that you know is protecting you know police officers and you know soldiers all over the world. Stephanie Kowalski or something something like, like that. that. 
It was, yeah. it was a very, Check it was a very Polish name. It. Yeah. Very it Polish was. name. And she was from, uh, she was from Katanning, I think I said. Yeah. Interesting. Fun fact, Luke, before I wrap up my Dude. history, by the late 12th century, it was considered a dishonor for a knight to attack another knight without allowing his opponent to don his armor. Okay. Yeah. They, they, they had a lot of like weird rules that they did. Like, it's just like, if you want to win, just win. You know? I'm with you. I would have been the guy who was like stabbing him with my lance in the back <laughs> as he was getting dressed. It's fine. No honor. Anyways, oh. before we move on with how it's made and things of that sort, maybe it's time for this week's Luke's rant. Okay, so I did my best to kind of keep this connected to armor and I couldn't. Uh, so I'm, I'm just putting excited. it out there. So this morning, uh, I had a chance. I, I came into work a little bit late and because uh, I was out doing some shopping and I had uh chick-fil-a for breakfast oh and this is like more of like a, i got the chicken and a biscuit obviously because uh, yeah. it's like the best thing they have and is. this is more like a i'm gonna say uh you should like a, a more you know so as you all know chick-fil-a's aren't open on sundays fact but popeye's chicken there's a brand new one right in robinson town center near my house Ooh. and they have pretty good they're not as good as the chick-fil-a chicken and a biscuit sandwich but it's a pretty good chicken sandwich so this is more like a psa if you're looking for a good chicken a breakfast sandwich check out a popeyes and make sure you put on they have this like spicy hot sauce that you put on top of it and it's Ooh. so good this so. episode brought to you by popeyes chicken yeah because they're open on sundays <laughs> I love that. Very good, Luke. Um, I haven't been to Popeye's in quite a while, but it is, as little Nikki says, Popeye's chicken is the, don't worry about it. Anyways, moving on to how it is made, Luke. Okay. So I'll kind of start. And if you want to fill in the blanks, because that's kind of where I have most so of my blanks. information. So, yeah. so, so like you said, very rarely would you just go and get all of your armor done at one time, but let's just say that you could. I could. Uh, you could. So yeah. this starts out very much, like I said, at the, the top of the show, like these cats were like, they were tailors. So you would go in and the blacksmith or the blacksmith's assistant would basically measure you up. Armor. Armor. Arm, armorer. I think Spelled I'm pronouncing funny that correctly. With okay. uh, so what they, would, they would basically measure you up. They'd measure like whatever you were getting. So they'd measure like your wrist to your elbows. They'd measure, you know, the length of your hands. They'd measure, you know, the size of your heads. So they would take all your body measurements and they had templates that they would use. And these templates were for whatever particular shape. Because remember, in most cases, this stuff wasn't just cut and flat. They were they were cold forming some of the easy shapes. So they would just hammer the heck out of a piece of they thin would. metal. Uh, but like something like a helmet or a breastplate or something that they had to do like really specific bends and they had to, they actually had to heat it and form it and heat it and form it and quench it finally to, for hardness. Um, so they would take Can these you templates. imagine being that good at something that you could like make a helmet that fits someone properly? No, oh, I imagine sorry. it chafed a lot. Uh, <laughs> a lot of baby powder was used under those <laughs> things, I'm sure. So, so they would basically get all your measurements and again, lay it out like on a template. They would cut all of this stuff uh, by hand, which, and keep in mind, when, when we think of like metal, like we think of like, oh, this is probably like half inch, quarter inch. This was like yeah. really super thin pieces of, of iron. This this wasn't really thick stuff. This was this was relatively, you know, thin material. And a lot of it was really brittle because they didn't have like the metallurgic techniques to imagine a half inch thick armor, full body. Like it did oh. weigh like nine million. Oh pounds. my goodness. <laughs> yeah. So so once they finished the cold forming, the easy stuff, they would then start to do the more complicated stuff in like specifically things where they had to put stiffening ribs in. So like if they were connecting pieces together where like one rib was laying over top of another rib, that would have to be done with heating and tempering. So once they got all the individual pieces, now it, it, they have to put this together kind of like an armadillo, like these pieces have to be able to move in 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 sync with one another so you can't just put them on and put a rivet on you have to 
put them in place and make sure that they can articulate so you can bend your arm and move your you know shoulder all you can and turn your head so depending on which joint it was it was a little more difficult to get like the articulation correct and then they'd have to go through and maybe trim it up if it was rubbing uh so once they got all of the armor adjusted then they would start the riveting process and it was Ooh, typically a, riveting. it was typically a hut rivet the way they would do this so it was a, a red hut rivet that would get driven through you know two holes and then they would hold one side and they would just hammer the heck out of the bottom side uh to get any kind of rivets put in place um then once everything was good when it was completely assembled sometimes there'd be chain mail that was riveted in for like the the elbows where they needed something completely loose um then what they would do is they would then polish the armor because typically if you were a knight of any substance like you or i would be uh -huh, you'd uh -huh. have highly polished armor so it would go to polishing and finishing and they would all they would add all kinds of filigree so all kinds of etching and details and depending on how much you spent you'd get more filigree if you didn't spend a lot you get less filigree i like then, that word then they had to put in all the strapping so this was like so the armor very rarely wrapped all the way around your body. You could strap on your armor. So exactly. Yeah. So you would so you'd have like three or four leather straps on your forearms. You'd have it on the backs of your legs. You pretty much just protected the front of your body. Um, you didn't really it's, you didn't care about the back, I guess. Um, and then they would line the armor in most cases with some type of fur or felt or some kind of fabric because these things were like it's, it's bare metal scraping up against your body. I'm sure, like I said, I'm I'm sure these these cats got chafed pretty bad. Um, then once they were all done, they'd come back for the fitting, make any kind of adjustments that they would have to make, um, and then their armor was complete. Anything well I missed? Well done. Uh, no, just a few things that I'll kind of throw out there. So they there is a part where they'd like start the armor and if it was really quality for a custom fit for a person, they would actually bring that person back in for a fitting, almost do a fitting kind of like with a suit or something mm -hmm. where it would be custom tailored and they would do the measurements. And then once it was finished, like you're saying, they'd bring them back in for those final tweaks to make sure that everything fit just right. Uh, I thought that was interesting. Uh, you're, you're talking through all of this. A lot of the different pieces though would actually be handled by different folks. So it wouldn't necessarily be that you go to James the blacksmith and he just like pounds out all of this armor for you. Like there were actually they specialized specialized things like like you were saying the people with the leather straps might be one person. The person who would uh hammer out the armor might be a person. Like each of these things had the person who did like the engraving or the what was it the filigree. Fil filigree that person would probably be someone different than the initial armorer that you'd be working with. So a lot of people were involved in this process, but something that I thought was really interesting and I had no idea of that until like the 17th century, steel plates were mostly made out of like big metal blocks, right? And blacksmiths used hammers, which like you said, you know, for parts of them, they would kind of shape them and the rivets and stuff like that. But they also would use giant water powered mechanisms that were hammers that would hammer the heck out of these metal blocks oh. to get them to the thickness that they needed to be for them to then uh use a normal hammer to start shaping them so that was pretty pretty interesting to me um and then i guess i just had a couple other things that i would throw in there before i have one more game for us to play luke uh, so one thing i also thought was interesting is like learning this craft so you don't just start out like say, hey, I'm going to be a blacksmith one day. You kind of had to become a blacksmith apprentice, which actually meant that you needed to have some sort of connection into the blacksmith industry. So maybe your parents are already the village blacksmith or uh, they know somebody and they accept you on as an apprentice. But you start off by doing crappy stuff like oh, yeah. sweeping the floors and stoking the Load fires. in the coal, and, yeah. Yeah, all of that sort of like menial labor. But from there, once you're somewhat useful, they ship you off. They're like, all right, you're going to become a journeyman. And they send you off either to like another family member in another town or some other armorer that is out there. And you go off there and learn skills from them. So then after you are there for a while, you come back home. And not only have you learned more about how to become a blacksmith and do things properly or an armorer, but you've also learned new skills that that armor may have specialized in and you're bringing that knowledge back to your town or village. Oh. And that's kind of how they would 
like expand the knowledge of working with things. So I thought that was kind of interesting. I have two questions for you. Oh, let's hear it. Since you want to play a game. So uh -huh. what was the, how, how many years salary did a full suit of armor typically cost a night? Two. Three. Oh, it's pretty so close. three, and I don't know what a knight made, but I guess just someone said the the average. So if you if a knight saved up all his money from you know the lands that he ruled, like it, would, it would be knight. three years of their uh, of of savings it would take to do one full suit of armor uh, for themselves. I'd be like Heath Ledger in that movie. <laughs> like I'd be a, really a knight's good tale. Knight. That was a good movie. I like that movie. Some movie. Uh, next question: <laughs> How much does uh, a full set of plate armor? weigh average 25 kilograms i don't know what a kilogram is but 60 pounds all right i think i was pretty close 2.2 <laughs> times isn't it 2.2 or is it one point yeah i think it's 2.2 times that so i was close luke okay um good. good well good all right true or false luke armor was worn only by knights true i think false luke false i just said they had to save their money well, other okay. people bought it too. Like royalty would buy armor. Oh. Uh, and then like there were other folks in the army. They wouldn't necessarily wear as nice of armor, but uh, they could have it as They'd well. They'd get the hand-me-downs. Firstly, also some facts about this. Yeah, they get the hand-me-downs. The people that died in war got... Anyways, first, knights rarely fought alone, nor did medieval or renaissance armies consist entirely of mounted knights. And second, it is wrong to assume that every nobleman was a knight. Knights are not born, but created by other knights, feudal lords, and sometimes priests. I didn't know priests could make knights, but I like it. True or false, Luke? Women of earlier times never fought in battle or wore armor. False. You are correct. That Joan is of Arc. Joan right? of Arc. That's right. That's a good movie, too. Joan of Arc was? Yeah. True or false? Well, you already answered this one. Armor was so expensive that only princes and rich nobility could afford it. So yeah. wrong. Uh, armor is extremely heavy and renders its wear immobile. Uh, false. 60 pounds isn't false. terrible. Correct. When, right. I, when, when I go backpacking, my, my, back, my backpack weighs like 45 pounds sometimes. I'm good. There you go. Oh, wow. You're so strong. That's heavy. I'm very strong. You are. Uh, true or false? Knights had to be hoisted on to their saddles with cranes. Oh, true. I believe we saw. That is false, Luke. That is false. How do you? But that doesn't necessarily mean that all of their armor was on at that time. Oh, like, they'd get on like and then put some armies more on. and their helmets and their leggies. They can all get added on there. Those were the technical terms we didn't cover in the first game. Leggies. And then last one, yes, leggies. True or false? Only knights were allowed to carry a sword. S words. Uh, I think I think that's true. Wrong or at least not entirely true. Oh, okay. So as with wearing armor, and I know that swords aren't really armor related, not everyone who carried a sword was a knight, but the idea that the sword is an exclusively knightly weapon isn't entirely wrong. So the custom, or almost like a right even, was to wear a sword, like to wear a sword varied according to time, place, and changing regulations. So there were times that that was probably true and places that that was probably true, but not necessarily a global thing. Gotcha. So that's that. Anything else you wanted to add there, Mr. Luke? That's all I got. I, sir, I can't. Sir Luke. I, sir Luke. I can't wait to go to what's that? What's that place where you go watch people the joust? Uh, no, oh, no. Uh, it's, it's the restaurant <laughs> where they and you drink. Medieval and, times. Or I want to go to like Medieval that. times now. Do Next we time we go to Vegas. Edge? No, but I think there's one in Las Vegas. If you and I end up in Las Vegas together in another year or so for work, we're going to Medieval times. I'm in. I love that. Okay. Well, hopefully you all loved this episode, learned how to hammer out some armor learned about the history of how it changed over time and enjoyed Luke naming every piece of armor correctly. If you did love it, if you want to get a shout out, if you want some stickers, if you just want to say hello, how about you email us at unprofessionalengineering at gmail.com. And until next time, see ya.